Hi guys, Redneck Computer Geek here, and welcome to the first of a few different teardown videos of Main Mud Mower. A lot of people have asked why it is I'm tearing Main Mud Mower apart, and the basic straightforward answer is I want to start fresh with the Mud Mower world and with something that is new and exciting. Main Mud Mower has had its frame bent three different times while plowing. I've had to take sledgehammers to it. I've had to re-weld different parts of it. It's on its fourth transmission right now. It never actually blew the Spicer Bomb transmission. If you haven't seen that, it's where I created a locker by Melted Down Zinc. I'll post a link for that down in the description. But it's time. It's bent. It's permanently warped. And we're going to tear down all the parts and take a look at it along the way. Um, that being said, I'd like to go and start off with, with every death comes light. And part of that is that parts from main mud mower, certain parts are going to go into the mud wizard build. But the other part is, with the death of a YouTube legend, I want to see life go into some other channels on YouTube. The first one that I'd like to go and give a shout out to is a channel called Lawn Gone. And I'll post up a picture of his rig right now. I've been following this build. At the time of making this video, he only has about 225 subscribers. He's a really good guy, really down to earth, very concise on how he does his build. And he has a lot of really good ideas. And he's going to be running with another favorite YouTuber of mine, Doc Sprocket. And they're going to be going out. They're going to be doing romps this year. And I really support them, and I hope you guys do too. So, check down in the description. You're going to find a link to his channel. Go to it, subscribe, tell him I sent you. The other thing I'd like to pass on is just another bit of YouTube knowledge for those of you with smaller channels. One thing that YouTube does that most people don't realize is that if you have a small channel... If you do not have links in your description to A, your channel, B, another video, or C, both of those and or somebody else's channel, what YouTube automatically decides is to send the next video over from a larger channel. So if you're at 2,000 subscribers, then the next video that it shows for the next view is from say a 5,000 subscriber and then the next one from him if he doesn't have stuff in his description ends up going to a 10,000 from there to a 50,000 from there to a hundred and fifty thousand so if you have a group of you that make videos or you have a group of friends that work together make sure in your description you are always posting up links to a video you like of theirs, links to their particular YouTube channel, and make sure you post up a few links to things that were covered in your video. Otherwise, YouTube assumes that you're not worth watching anymore, and they bump it up to the next bigger guy. That's the way YouTube works. That's how come the, the person who ends up with the most views happens to also have the most subscribers. Keep that in mind when you're making videos. Post up links to the friends of yours that have other YouTube channels in your description. Keep it within your group. That being said, let's move on to breaking it down. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to rip this hood straight off. This hood is junk. It was a really major learning experience for me. And... I have come up with revisions on how I'm going to build the hood for Mud, Mud Wizard. We'll be covering that, but the Mud Wizard build is going to be done during the ATLTF.com build-off. It starts on February 1st. Also check in the description for the link to the ATLTF.com. Go there, sign up, register, do the build-off with me. Let's get all kinds of people in it this year. So, I don't want to destroy the hood too much because it does have working fog lights in it that are the old school style fog lights, as you can see right there. 
Now they're fiberglassed in and I'm going to have to cut them out or smash them, but they're still usable for later projects. So probably going to seem stupid in one of those tips and tricks categories, but I really like these one gallon gas tanks and the reason being is because when you're dealing with draining out carbs, they fit right here where a lot of gas tanks don't, which makes dropping this down in much easier. The other thing is that because they're so small, you can fit it in like this and then set the fuel line in and then up and over it and kitty corner it on the ground. So we're going to see if we can do it on video, but guaranteed I'll mess it up just because it's video. So we're going to undo this and you want to undo it to the point you start to see gas seeping and pull it and set it in the nozzle and then down in between. So there we go, we'll get the gas tank drained out and then we're going to take the tank out and I'll show you guys a little bit of the electrical in the system. So this is the type where you've got the hose going through the firewall section over here that they kind of have in and you get these little crimp on connections. Now those you just put on with a pair of pliers but what happens is a lot of times the rubber here ends up sealing onto these and if you got a set of these slide pliers you can grab on with the center and give it just a slight twist like that and now it'll pull off by hand. There we are. So from here, we can feed this back through, pull our tank up through the top, and go from there. Okay, so we're going to freehand this one with the camera so that hopefully you can see everything. This right here, this comes out from underneath your flywheel. Now this is your diode side, and this is your headlights. Now, the way that you remember which one is which is diode, dead battery. Diode, dead battery. So if this does not connect to your battery side of your starter solenoid, your battery will never charge and it will be dead. That's how you remember. This is headlights. Now when you come down here on this brig setup, you're going to have these two wires here. This, if you have a solenoid, an electronic control solenoid in your carb, this is what goes to it. If you've done a solenoid delete, this is dead and it doesn't matter. This is your black kill wire. This is what goes to your kill toggle. If this grounds out at any point, it kills the motor. It will not have spark, therefore it does not fire, and it dies. But when you go through this connection, your red diode wire turns blue. So that blue wire comes back through and then you connect that to the red side of things further up here. So that red, if you have an inline voltmeter, this red goes to the voltmeter. That voltmeter goes to a fuse, and from that fuse, you come around to your solenoid. So you have your positive side of your solenoid, which goes to your battery. Your red diode lead, remember, diode dead battery. Your red diode lead goes here, and this side goes to your starter. And that's this big red wire coming out of here, comes back across, and goes into your starter here. Now, if you have a three-prong starter, you have your battery, I'm sorry, solenoid, if you have a three-pronged solenoid, you've got two big, one small, 
then you have one for the battery, one for the starter, and your third one you put positive to because the solenoid is self-grounding. Now if you have a four-prong solenoid, battery, starter, one of them gets positive voltage, the other one you put a line that grounds it to the chassis. And that acts as your ground for your solenoid. So up here, up and behind, all we got is just positive coming from the battery side of the solenoid, going to another wire which goes down and hits the solenoid on one of the small terminals. This up here, this is our toggle. Alright, so up inside here, we've got our toggle switch, and that right there goes to the black wire that goes underneath the coil, so that's coil kill. And then this down here, this toggle switch, goes to the headlights, that wire I showed you next to the diode. There you go. And we'll show you what the panel looks like from up here. This is my winch control. Headlights. Push button start. Kill. Now remember if you use a regular off the shelf on off switch. Off is on. On is off. Alright, so a lot of people ask about the gas pedal setup and how it's bolted in. But it basically isn't anything different than how your normal setup is. This is the through cable, and it's just got a regular flathead here. But what I did was I took the spring, and I looped the spring through the whole thing. So in order to put the spring on, you have to actually pull the whole screw out. So from there, it drops out and the wire pulls out through like that and that holds it in place on it so it can't ever come loose and there's the throttle assembly right there like you've seen in other videos we'll just put this back in so we don't lose it alright so now that all three of those are out of there should just pull right off there we are. And that's what the bottom looks like. And this is the stop that I'm talking about when I talk about having cut a stop in. There we are. Alright, so at this point we're going to drop this whole front steering clip. And... What I'm going to do is take these tires off in order to get some weight off of it before I do because this is a cast iron front axle and it weighs quite a bit more than a regular stamp steel one. If you've never taken these off, they're quite simple. Basically, you got a C-clip here and you just set your screwdriver in the C-clip and give it a pull against the axle and then pull against the other side. There we are. So here's a C-clip if you've never seen one. And basically, you set your screwdriver in on the end like that and you pull away and it undoes itself. These ones are actually upgraded ones that I picked up at the hardware store. They're a little thicker than stock after I had a front tire come loose on the trail. Then behind them, you got a big old washer. And then from there, you just pull the tire off. And here, you can see the worn out copper bushing on the inside. And it looks like the one on this side actually is almost degraded and gone. You can see it there. Now, in the future, I'll be taking and upgrading these to having bearings. I actually did that on a previous video. I can post a link for that in the description. But this is actually another type of C-clip on this side. A hardware store type. Which is like this. And I don't like these 
because over time this little piece that's right in here tends to rust out and they fall off but they're way easier to take off really quick just a side note and here we go again looks like the copper bushing that I made is pretty well toast Oh, you can see it on that side slightly sticking out but it worked at the time just regular copper pipe like you pick up at the hardware store so from here we're going to punch out these four on that side and then we're going to undo this and then punch out these four on this side I really love these electric impacts and yes they're nowhere near as strong as an air impact but for this kind of work uh, like about 50 bucks or so at your average auto parts store they're worth it just make sure you pay attention because the upright trigger on some of them is reverse so always check it now your ball joint is going to be a 9 16 on bottom but on the inside of the ball joint so this will be a 9 16 but on the inside is a nut right there and you're going to put a half inch on that and then just pull it up out there we go and on the top is going to be a lock washer so hold on to that for reassembly now we're going to slam these four out and you got to be careful this axle is going to want to drop So unfortunately my frame is so bent the axle didn't want to drop but if we go back and forth with it I bet it will there it goes and there you are it's your full axle assembly removed for the front as you can see it's a cast iron style it even says it right there it's got greasable zerts in it and it uses the same bushing inserts as the stamped steel ones so if you can find those at a junkyard with good bushings, rip them out, put them in your cast iron. Alright, so I wanted to show you guys this while I'm disassembling it. So this is my skid plate on front, and I get a lot of people asking, what are these bolts for? And there's two bolts here, and then there's two bolts on the other side here. And the reason for this is not so that I can rebuild it, it's so I can remove it. And that's because the only way to get the muffler out is to undo that bolt, undo the two on the other side of the engine there, and drop the muffler out through. So if I ever needed to change this muffler out, if this was not a removable plate, I could never get it out the bottom, and I'd have to lift the whole entire motor out. Now, what we're going to do at this point is in underneath here, let me switch modes. So in underneath here we got our drive pulley here and we've got our clutch, we've got our idler, and we got our secondary idler that we installed. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to push down on the brake, throw this belt off of here. I'm going to take an impact to this, although it's really greased up so I bet it'll probably come off with just a regular wrench. Alright, so we're going to see if we can get this exhaust to come loose and hang here. We've got a 3 8 here, which is this front bolt on the front of the motor. Now on the side here, we've got this quarter inch hex. There's one here and one here. What you want to do is find one of these hex sockets that's as thin as possible, usually the cheaper brand, because it doesn't quite fit next to the exhaust, and then peen it in.
Now once you start that, give it just a shake to break loose. And there we are. There we are. We're going to pull that exhaust gasket out and let it just hang off to the side. And then drop it back out through. Hi, so I hope you guys are really liking the new infrared feature. Oh wait, let me turn it on. There we go. If you like it, comment down below whether this is worth using and helps you guys. So here's the pulley setup. These are stock keepers that I left on. This one here actually has the stock keeper right here on this side, the tab. This is a flipped pulley. I've actually shown you guys several times how to make these. But basically, I take this, the deck drive pulley, and I cut it off, which is why you can see this is cut here, with a torch or with a plasma cutter. And then I take the drive pulley that's stock, and I cut it out and around in here. I plant this up against it, measure it out, make sure it's centered, and then I weld the hole inside. A lot of people ask me about my clutch setup. It's a stock setup, but this, this is a stock Craftsman spring. This is a stock MTD clutch spring. And the funny thing is, is they fit over the top of each other onto a Craftsman clutch. And that hooks up here in underneath the plate where it normally would. And this one here hooks through the top of the Craftsman one and then hooks right onto the regular clutch location underneath all of this gibberish. There we go. So from there we come down through, we've got our adjuster there, we've got our shifter here, and our regular pulley. So what we're going to do is push down on this, and we're going to pop it off of here and take the whole belt out of the assembly, take off the engine, pulley here and then I'll show you where exactly the mounts are for the motor which we should be able to see right now actually there's one right here there's one right here there's one right here and the other one is actually underneath this clutch which is why you need the belt off it's If I can get it right there. So you got to actually pop your clutch to get to it. We're going to take those off and pull the motor. Alright, so we're going to start pulling the rest of the steering. So we're going to need a 916 for this. And just impact it off. There's a big ginormous washer on the inside. And you're going to have this little cog thing and just jerk it back and forth and it pops right off and then this piece here pulls back off so if you're trying to set up your alignment that's what this piece is for I'll pull it over here so you can see it this is how you adjust your alignment of your steering wheel like such alright so if we grab a half inch on each side this zips right off Drive the bolt through and pull your shaft. A lot of times it will be rusted on and you're going to have to go back and forth multiple times. Alright, so if we vice grip this and we have a 5 8 we can put it on top and rotate it and loosen it up. And it up. Alright, so inside here you should have a washer sitting on top and then this retaining clip here. Now underneath one, two, three, four points in the bottom, you're going to have bolts coming up through. But this is what you need to do first. You need to pop this off the side of the shaft. There we go. And then pull.
pull it back out. Now from here you should be able to bounce this up and down. And then drive it out through. There we go. Now if we get in underneath, now that that's pulled through, now we can get underneath and get one, two, three, four, and we'll show you that with the infrared. So looking at it from the front of the tractor, we've got one bolt here. We've got what should be a bolt in underneath here that seems to have snapped off. We've got another bolt right here, and then in behind, next to where this pulley is here, there's another bolt here. So you can use this hole as a guide. One, two, three, four. So I'd have to say one of the most common questions I get asked all the time is what size are the bear claws that I run? And the answer to that question is that there are the large lug bear claws and they're six ply and they're 22 12 by 8 and if you're somebody who follows me you're going to say well how come it is you always recommend the 22 11 by 8 and the reason being is because with these being so wide that when the tractor actually contorts that the inside lugs have a tendency to actually hit things on the inside and there's actually a permanent kind of groovish type area on the inside of the frame here so these are 12 wide but I recommend the 11 now this particular transmission is actually out of another video and what it is is I ended up discovering that you could take an MS203 and you could buy it brand spanking new off surpluscenter.com and the internals of a 203, a 204, a 205 and a 206 are all exactly the same except for the gear ratio. So the bolts that hold in these transaxles are nothing special. They're just regular half inch bolts and they zip out pretty decently. If they don't come out easy, you've got bigger issues like frame flex and all kinds of other stuff. Now there's an ongoing debate on these as to whether you should put it with the bolt side up or whether you should put it bolt side down. I do it with the bolt going through this way and the reason being is because it just is easier to assemble that way. It's not whether it's right or wrong. It's just easier for me that way because I use a chain. Now my whole assembly actually right now the entire tractor is actually sitting on the ATV rack on the rear right now. And then these ones here, you got to be careful because they're self taps into the case. So pull those off nice and carefully. And then this one should be the last one. It should drop into my hand. So we pull it forward and pull the shifter out and we should be all set.
here? Well, the answer is, I intend to enter into the ATLTF build-off this year with the Mud Wizard. We're going to be putting some parts that are new, some parts that are old, and some new ideas in from an old idea plate. Next big thing, though, we got to get the engine in the Mud Wizard up and running correctly. A lot of you, like me, suspect that it's got a head gasket issue, and that's exactly what's in this package. Thanks everyone for supporting my channel. Share this up if you think this disassembly is going to help somebody you know that's working on a Craftsman tractor.